You're a medical cannabis patient, and tomorrow you have a workplace drug test. Today, we're going to talk all about it. Welcome to Discover Marijuana. I'm Tim Pickett. I'm here with J.D. Lawrence and the Chief Legal Counsel for Wholesome Co. Medical Cannabis Pharmacy here in Utah. And Blake Smith, the CEO and Chief Science Officer for Zion. We're talking about workplace testing and medical cannabis patients here in Utah. Now, there's all kinds of drug tests for, for cannabis, for THC. Uh, blood, hair, saliva, there's a breath test. But the gold standard is the urine test. It's cheap. Uh, we know a lot about it, right? Like, let's talk about it. What metabolites, what, what are we actually testing for? So it's basically an immunoassay where it's going to bind, and it's going to bind basically anything that's a THC analog. And so if we're talking about delta-8, delta-9, delta-10, uh, alpha-hydroxy, delta-11, and that's the one that actually is showing up for the test. And urine tests are not specific enough to be able to differentiate between all those. So it will all show up as THC. As positive. And here's the other thing is, you know, the urine test, if you only have a couple micrograms in your system at that point, it probably won't show up. On a blood test, it'll That'd show up there. down to 0.1 nanograms, so 10 to the minus 9. And so know what kind of test that they're going to be using before. So On a test... Um, and I've read some research on this. There's, you can almost hot box a room. There's, there are people who've, you know, come up positive on a drug test mm -hmm. and said, oh, I just took, you know, I was just in a contact high situation. But that seems to be pretty rare. Like, it's pretty hard to come up positive just from a contact high. If somebody blows smoke in your face, you're not going to come up high or yeah. show up on a test. That's, that's not going to happen. Right. I'd grab the brownie. No, no. I'm using topicals. It's not going to show up either. Talk about the the where THC is stored in the body. Sure. So this is an abundance for almost any kind of pharmaceutical you're going to take, and even chemicals. If you get exposed to chemicals, your body typically will store things in fat cells. And so what ends up happening is a lot of times people will talk about trying to do a flush, but if you're storing things in your fat and you start flushing fat, your chances of having that come back or show up in a test is very high. Right. It takes about an average of almost, well, it's between two, I think it's between one and three days for a urine test to actually come up positive most of the time, which, which wouldn't test at all if you were high at work or, or anything like that. Correct. What, what's your rights as a cannabis patient, J.D., with this type of thing, with workplace testing? So Utah's cannabis laws don't have any protections for private employees. So a private business is free to continue discriminating against medical cannabis patients. Even if you're a card-holding patient, they can, they can drug test you either pre-employment or during employment and terminate you on that basis or take some sort of adverse employment action. Now, there is protection, uh, some protections for state and political subdivision employees. However, there are some conditions on that. If it would impact any sort of federal funding or any sort of federal licensure or anything like that, they don't have to abide by that. Um, also now there are not protections for peace officers, but there are protections for first responders um, or your paramedics and stuff like that. However, there's another caveat that you can't consume within 12 hours of, you know, of your next shift. So while there are some protections, they're pretty narrow. Um, but most you're seeing a lot of states, not I mean, not not talking about Utah, but a lot of states and a lot of cities really start to do away with private employment drug screenings for cannabis. Um, some places have passed laws. Some states have. Some municipalities have. So it's a it's a step in the right direction. But here in Utah, unfortunately, if you work for a private company, you have zero protections. zero protections. So. And the 12 hour thing, just like we were talking, I mean, it, if it took you a day to, to uh, I think the study that, that we had talked about in the presentation that we gave was 36 hours was the average time it took to actually even become positive. So how does that work out of your system then? If, for example, you knew about this a couple of weeks, not saying that we would recommend you do this, but you know, what do you do if you need to be clean on a drug screen? Um, you need enough time first and foremost, but the solution to pollution is dilution. So you want to start diluting as much as you possibly can. If nothing else, that will start giving you a false positive or a false negative. 
if you can, if, if, if the test can't come back definitively showing something, mm -hmm. then they have to retest and typically you'll schedule later. And so that gives you more time in between when that to, actually happens. To dilute, we wrote an interesting blog article on utahmarijuana.org that is, it talks about, in fact, we had somebody do the test. So we had somebody do the, the, uh, the sauna test. We've heard about the sauna test consume cannabis and then go to the sauna and try to excrete it all. That didn't work, came up positive in our sample. And then try a product over the counter they found at the vape shop. That was like six pills and a bunch of liquid. That didn't work at all. Look, your liver is ultimately going to be your filter and it's going to end up having to bind it to urea. It's mm -hmm. not gonna just come out in your sweat. It's not just gonna come out in any other ways. Your body has to process it. And so this whole concept of like, I'm gonna quickly, you know, eat a cheeseburger upside down or whatever, like that, that's just not how the body right. works. That, that's not a thing. So you gotta find a way to actually just kick the body's metabolism into higher gear. And, and so, you know, I heard people do hot peppers and a lot of capsaicin yeah, the, and stuff yeah. like that. Look, it, it's so just the, not the way to think about it. When I talk to patients on average, uh, I, there's about a third of patients who about one week in will be negative depending on the sensitivity of the test. And 75% of, of people will be clean after two weeks. So there's a three in four chance that you'll be clean after two weeks. JD, if you got caught trying to manipulate the test though, w wouldn't that be just way worse than coming up positive? I mean, I don't think either one of them are ideal, obviously, because you're, you're falsifying the results or attempting to falsify the results of a drug test. Um, but also the results could mean, you know, could mean your job. And I think it just underscores the importance of, you know, re-examining these policies, right? Whether these are still wise policies to have. Um, you know, some states have gone as far as to enact, you know, protections mm -hmm. for private employers, right? Um, but here in Utah, they've kind of tried to strike a balance between, you know, state and, and, and private. And really, this is another one of the, you know, kind of issues that federal illegality creates, right? Because it remains a federally controlled substance you know, they allow employers to follow the federal law. So once federal law changes, assuming, you know, that it does in the next, you know, year to two years, um, that's something that would change, you know, change with it. I, I really think people, we, businesses should get away from, you know, dr you know pre-employment drug screenings and or employment drug screenings, especially for cannabis, and especially if it's a medical cannabis patient, right? Where you would, you, I mean, I'm not sure very many jobs are screening for legal opioids, right? So to right. me, it's like, wouldn't it be kind of a similar a similar type of thing, and then just leave it up to if it does then infect your, you know, affect your job performance, you know, or you're intoxicated on the job, then you can take, you know, then you can take those actions. That's a really, really good point. And so even at Zion, so obviously we're cannabis friendly, yeah, right. We have to have HR policies around impairment because, you know, we have expensive equipment, we drive forklifts, you know, and so even though we're cannabis friendly. You cannot be impaired on the job to yeah. do most of the functions that we do at, at the workplace. And so, you know, you take your medicine, but it needs to be within the structure that it was given. And if you are impaired, then, you know, that's still a potential reason that you could cause you some problems at the job. So if you're a patient, I think what we're hearing is, you know, you need to know your workplace policies. You need to try your best to abide by those and know what you're up against as a medical cannabis patient for sure. Abstinence for a couple of weeks will will give you a pretty good chance, but again, you don't you're not getting to take your medicine, so that's a problem for a lot of patients. And as an employer, uh, like Blake said, we've got to start having smart policies regarding drug testing. I can't tell with a urine test on THC whether or not the the person has used it, except for maybe within the past two weeks or three weeks, that's it. They're not, there's no test for impairment on the job. That's right. Other than, like, if you're acting impaired on the job, right? That's right. So we want to hear about your comments uh, and your experiences with workplace drug testing on the videos. Uh, comment below because we'd love to hear it. We'd love to hear how people are dealing with this and what changes are being made in the workplace.